Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on climate change and foreign risk. It's the flight event of the 54th ADB annual meeting. As we are aware of the considerate, considerate, uh, considerable um, implication of the climate change for the sovereign list, this webinar is featured the um, presentation of the recent ADBI research that explored the transmission channel and empirical link between climate change effects of sovereign risk, establishing a platform for policy dialogue on how climate related sovereign risk can be managed and practiced. To start this webinar, I would like to invite uh, Professor Dr. Tetsushi Sonobe, the Dean and the CEO of the Asian Development Bank Institute, to deliver the, to deliver the opening remarks. Dean Sonobe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pichia. Hello and welcome. Uh, these three days of the 54th ADB annual meeting have been full of rich discussions on a range of uh, key policy action areas. It's my great pleasure to provide opening remarks on the final day at this side event on climate change and sovereign risk, which is so timely and relevant a topic that this side event has scores of distinguished speakers and I expect a large number of viewers. Thank you very much everyone for joining us. ADB Institute, especially today's presenter, John Byrne, has been interested in this issue for years for the following reason. The climate change poses a serious threat to development in climate vulnerable countries, including Asia and the Pacific, being particularly exposed to the threat. In addition to the gradual effects of global warming, the economies in the region are also vulnerable to transition risks associated with policies aimed at mitigation, the development of new climate-friendly technologies, and the changes in consumer preferences. Concerted efforts in climate change adaptation are needed to reduce vulnerability. The amount needed to invest in adaptation and resilience will be substantial, especially for those economies highly exposed. However, if these investments fail to be undertaken in the near future, it is likely to result in much greater costs in the future, uh, future, including in the form of higher sovereign borrowing costs, because the absence of effective investment now for adaptation will leave these countries' economies vulnerable. Over time, there is a risk that the worsening of climate change and associated macroeconomic impacts will further undermine public finance. The poorer countries exposed to climate disaster risk face another significant risk of not being able to finance necessary adaptation measures because of the higher cost of borrowing. Without external support, these economies may end up in vicious circle of greater climate vulnerability, worsening public finance, and potentially unsustainable debt burdens. Governments and the regional and global communities need to consider the potential impacts of climate change on the medium to long-term quality and sustainability of public finances and seek to mitigate risks. The focus of this afternoon's session is on improving our understanding about the link between climate change and the risks to the cost of sovereign borrowing and on effective policy responses. We are honored and delighted that Ingrid Van Uys, uh, Vice President for, uh, of ADB for Finance and Risk Management, uh, will deliver a keynote speech today uh, directly after my opening remarks. The ADB has been at the 
forefront in providing operational support and assistance to climate vulnerable economies in Asia and the Pacific. And Vice President Van Wees uh, understands very deeply uh, the financial implications for affected economies in the region. Following her speech, we will move to the presentation by John Barr, a research fellow at ADBI. Based on the research, uh, recent research, he will explain the conceptual transmission channel and empirical relationship between climate change and sovereign risk, as well as the policy implications of his findings. The webinar today also features a panel discussion of senior policy experts on climate issues, which will focus on how climate-related sovereign risks can be mitigated and managed. The panel session will be chaired by Peter Morgan of ADBI. The panel of speakers comprises senior officials from the OECD, the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, the Agricultural Development Bank of China, the AIFC Green Finance Center in Kazakhstan, and the Bangladesh Planning Commission. We very much look forward to hearing their views on this important topic. After the panel discussion, we'll have some time for general Q&A before hearing the closing remarks by ADBI Deputy Dean Sunji Beck. In anticipation of a fruitful uh, set of uh, discussions, and because uh, our time is limited to 90 minutes, I'll stop here and hand the floor back to Pichaya. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dean Sunobe. As mentioned by him, I would like us to turn the floor over and it's an our honor to invite the Vice President of the Asian Development Bank for Finance and Risk Management, Mr. English Van V, to deliver the keynote address. VP Van V, I give the floor to you. Thank you. Good day and warm greetings to all of you from Manila. I'm encouraged by the strong interest for this session and we'll start with an upbeat message, the rebounding of the global economy despite the pandemic. The outlook for Asia Pacific for 2021 and 2022 is good. Following its most severe crisis in the past six decades, which put most severe considerable constraint on most countries across the region, resulting in numerous sovereign credit rating downgrades. ADB forecasts growth in the region to rebound to 7.3% in 2021 and 5.3% in 2022. A strong rebound, but one which remained vulnerable to the evolvement of the current COVID-19 pandemic. Considerable amounts of financial resources are being deployed to counter its health and economic effects. Around 1.8 trillion US dollar of fiscal stimulus packages are being mobilized by governments in the region to avert the worst. However, when it concerns the environment and our climate, I'm downbeat. While this spending did mitigate the economic fallout, the benefits did not extend to a green and inclusive recovery. The United Nations in its 2021 SDG progress report for Asia and the Pacific concluded that the region is regressing on SDG 13, which is climate action, and SDG 14, which represents life on the water, as compared to 2000. As illustrated by the current pandemic, natural disasters generally cause large human suffering and economic loss in the immediate aftermath. They result in economic scarring by reversing hard-won development gains, weighing on productivity growth and cementing inequalities. This panel and this publication by the Asian Development Bank Institute in collaboration with the Center for Sustainable Finance, WWF 427, 
and inspire could therefore not be more pertinent than this time. The topic of climate change and sovereign risks in Asia and the Pacific will only grow in relevance as the time to address climate risk is rapidly running out. In my remarks today, I want to highlight three points. First, how Asia Pacific is severely impacted by climate related disasters and at the same time, missing an important key to addressing it. Second, how ADB assists its developing member countries or DMC in short, in addressing both the impact of climate change and strengthening disaster resilience. To close, some of the challenges posed by incorporating climate risk in sovereign credit ratings. So to start, let me emphasize that Asia Pacific is no stranger to natural disasters. Many DMCs, particularly the low-lying coastal communities and small island development states of the Pacific, are highly exposed and vulnerable to natural hazards. With the current trajectory of climate transition towards the 20 degrees Celsius scenario, this is only going to worsen. And Asia Pacific is expected to face the brunt of climate disasters. Economic losses caused by natural catastrophes are trending upwards. Over the past three decades, between 1990 and 2019, immediate damage to property, crops and livestock from natural disasters in the region amounted to almost 1.5 trillion US dollars and over 5.2 billion people affected. In 2020 alone, Asia's overall losses related to natural disasters amounted to a whopping 67 billion US dollars, of which only 3 billion, less than 5%, were insured. To illustrate this, I'll give you two examples of 2020. The world's costliest natural disaster was the severe flooding during the summer monsoon rains in the People's Republic of China. Losses amounted to approximately 17 billion US dollars, of which only around 2% was insured. Losses of the worst tropical cyclone in terms of damage, Cyclone Ampan, which made landfall in May in the Northern Indian Ocean, amounted to 14 billion US dollars. And again, only with marginal insurers or cat risk cover. The very low insurance concentration intensifies the fiscal impact of disasters on developing and emerging economies in the Asia and the Pacific. In absence of a third party for risk sharing, the sovereign effectively becomes the insurer of last resort, funding the immediate recovery and rehabilitation needs. With this, I turn to my second point. ADB's assistance with reducing climate change impact. The COVID pandemic triggering global economic stimulus plan of multiple trillion US dollar has shown that a proactive approach in the form of pre-crisis preparedness, early warning systems, good governance, and scientific adaptations measures are good investments. If we fail to invest the millions and billions required for Paris alignment today, we will be facing a check exceeding multiple trillions. Whilst proactive policies and investments determine the extent to which economic shocks caused by natural disaster can either be mitigated or amplified, economic diversification can lower or shorten spikes in unemployment and disruption to economic activities. Quality social infrastructure fosters better health outcomes whilst reducing loss of lives and disruption to schooling. And finally, 
Countries with low government debt experience fast recovery, avoiding setbacks in human capital as fiscal space allows for Swiss disaster relief without the expense of cutting social expenditures. To conclude this point, the capacity and extent of health and social protection systems, quality of infrastructure, indebtedness, and economic diversification are important factors fostering the capacity of countries to withstand, adapt, and recover from adverse shocks. Consequently, poor economies and countries are generally more exposed to hazards and at a greater risk of loss of human life. Although the impact of climate risk is mitigated by strengthened resilience, the strongest and most urgent lever remains emission reduction. Asia currently accounts for about 47% of global carbon emissions. It's uniquely placed to lead global mitigation efforts since half of the envisaged global expansion of electrical power capacity in the next decade will be in Asia. We therefore often hear the battle of climate change can be won or lost in the Asian Pacific. Addressing climate change and strengthening disaster risk resilience are ADB's operational priorities. As part of its strategy 2030, ADB committed that 70% of its operations on a three-year rolling average address climate change, but also that ADB invest 80 billion of its own resources from 2019 to 2013, which is a 20 one year period, which could, which a mobilization factor of four, easily multiply to hundreds of billions of US dollars. To decrease emissions, ADB is scaling up investment in clean energy, energy efficiency, and low carbon transport and agriculture. It's catalyzing private sector investments and accelerating deployment of high level technologies that effectively and efficiently curb emissions. Reduction of the fiscal and economic exposure and enhanced infrastructure resilience requires a comprehensive risk diagnosis and multi-stakeholder involvement. For enhanced infrastructure resilience, ADB promotes risk-sensitive land use planning, integrates climate and disaster resilient measures into infrastructure projects, and includes operation and maintenance of these assets. ADB also supports disaster risk assessments of existing and planned infrastructure and ecosystems. With regard to the enhancement of financial resilience, I can share that ADB has innovated and expanded its products for sovereign financial disaster risk management. The, this country-based approach is enhanced with regional initiatives to pilot and promote regional disaster insurance schemes to pool funds and share risk. CAREC is one of our examples here. So let me now turn to my third point, the evolving journey of inclusion of climate risk in sovereign credit ratings. As highlighted by the report presented today, there's a strong correlation between climate risk and sovereign credit worthiness. When assessing credit risks of its DMCs, ADB is already incorporating climate and other environmental, social and governance, in short ESG related risks into its sovereign ratings. The different components are however, accounted for to varying degrees. Current practice at ADB, other multilateral development banks and rating agencies place considerable weight on governance factors when assessing sovereign credit worthiness. Social and environmental factors presently carry less weight, giving the perception that their impact on credit worthiness 
is longer term and therefore less relevant for the shorter to medium term. This perception, however, is shifting and more attention is being paid to these factors. So although ADB's approach is aligned with peers and rating agencies, we recognize that we must enhance and evolve our methodology. A key finding of the report discussed today is that in general, climate change is expected to be credit negative for sovereign ratings and can result in an increase of borrowing costs for affected nations. So to include, sorry, to conclude, I'd like to invite all of you to use the ingenuity, creativity and insights of all stakeholders, male and female, to work constructively on addressing one of the greatest challenges of our nation and of our generation. And herewith, I'd like to hand over back to the, back to the MC. Thank you very much, uh, VP Van Wees, for your comprehensive and insightful messages about the climate change impact and also ADB activities in support the developing country in Asia and the Pacific. Um, I would like just to move to the next section, the presentation on climate change and the cause of sovereign borrowing. Uh, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. John Byrne, the research fellow from Asian Development Bank Institute, to be the one who give the presentation. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pachaya. Um, so it's a pleasure to present this work here today. This is a culmination of a large project on climate change and the cost of sovereign borrowing, which was jointly completed with uh, SOAS University of London, Worldwide Fund for Nature Singapore and 427 recently. There's a policy report and ADBI book uh, available on this, which was published in October, 2020. So given the time, let me try to be efficient with my presentation. The structure is as follows. Um, I will firstly describe the transmission channels through which sovereign risk is affected by climate change. Um, secondly, I will talk about some empirical evidence. So um, based on empirical work that we carried out very recently for a, a global sample of economies with varying degrees of climate risk exposure, we look at the impact on the cost of sovereign borrowing. And finally, um, I will talk about the policy implications that fall out of all of this analysis. So firstly, on the transmission channels. So this slide, presents an overview of how climate change transmits to sovereign risk. Clearly, there are a number of different uh, channels through which this can take place, and I'll briefly go through them now. Um, so obviously, climate change can lead to a depletion of natural capital, and to the extent that this disrupts economic activity, um, there will be ramifications of this for the public finances and a spillover of that to sovereign risk profile. Um, fiscal impacts of climate related natural disasters are also a, a key channel through which climate change can affect sovereign risk. Um, this is related to the disruption in uh, revenue streams, for example, that can be caused by um, climate related uh, extreme events. Fiscal consequences of adaptation and mitigation policies are another channel through which sovereign risk can be affected. Um, I think that it's important to understand not only the physical risks, but also these transition risks and the imposition um, that these can have in terms of um, negative effects. And, and as an example of this, um, for example, uh, carbon taxes that are imposed to induce a more greener economy can have, uh, at least in the short term, negative implications for uh, the public finances and sovereign risk. More broadly, macroeconomic impacts of climate change need to be considered. Um, while the, the shock may be short term in nature, both from the demand side and the supply side, uh, of course, uh, climate change can have longer term negative repercussions on productive capacity and potential output. 
and this um, can spill over to uh, the cost of sovereign borrowing through the, the strains on the public finances that are imposed by this. Another um, avenue through which sovereign risk can be negatively affected is via financial sector stability and the extent to which climate related risks can lead to instability in the financial sector. And I'll, I'll come to that in more detail in the following slide. Um, another, yet another channel uh, relates to international trade and capital flows and the disruptions to balance of payments positions, which can uh, spill over to the sovereign, which I will also discuss in a little bit more detail in the following slide, uh, time permitting. And finally, um, impacts of climate change on political in political stability. So to the extent that climate change would lead to, uh, would worsen, this has been shown to induce some instability on the political front. Um, and this can, of course, spill over to the sovereign as well. So there, that's a, a brief picture of some of the key channels through which climate change can affect sovereign risk. As I mentioned, I will, I'll touch a little bit more deeply on two of these. I'll try to go fast because um, I'm aware of, of the time constraints that we have today. Um, so climate change of financial sector stability. So what we're talking about here is both physical climate risks and transition climate risks. So the physical climate risks pertain to what are termed acute risks or risks related to extreme weather events, as well as chronic risks related to a gradual rise in temperature. Um, and to the extent that um, a worsening of climate change would negatively affect the operational activities um, in the financial sector, this can lead to a, a worsening of uh, financial sector uh, uh, borrowing uh, capabilities and ability to pay back uh, their borrowing commitments and increases in non-performing loans. And this can spill over to the sovereign due to the, to the link between the financial sector and the sovereign. As well as that, transition climate risks can also manifest as credit risks for banks. Um, to take the example of Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines, up to $60 billion of coal-fired coal power plants are at risk of stranding um, or becoming obsolete. And this, of course, um, can lead to negative repercussions for credit risk, which can spill over to uh, sovereign risk. And one of the reasons that this can occur is through um, issues such as state-linked pension funds and investment companies, um, which cause a close nexus between the banking sector and, uh, and the sovereign. So essentially, an increase in vulnerability or financial fragility in the financial sector can, can then spill over to the sovereign. Um, next slide. So this is about climate change and international trade. So there are four points here. The first three refer to physical risks and the last one refers to transition risks. So with a worsening of climate change, um, the supply chains can become impaired. Um, to take the example of Southeast Asia, um, there's a very high share of network trade and total manufacturing outputs, out, sorry, out, exports um, in the region of 70%. So of course, in a scenario where climate change would um, worsen, then supply chains and productive capacities um, associated with these uh, supply chains across the various economies would be negatively affected. And this would put strains on the public finances and a worsening of the sovereign credit profile. Um, risks to agricultural exports um, is also a channel through which international trade is affected by climate change. And this will be dependent upon the share of total exports represented by agriculture, which is different across different economies. But this is a more significant a factor for um, some countries than others. And this is important to be aware of. Of course, tourism is affected as, as well um, as climate change would um, lead to negative effects on tourism streams and tourism revenue. Um, and this, this can um, put strains on the public finances as a result. On transition risk, as I mentioned, uh, the shift to a decarbonized world um, and a greener economy can 
have material impacts on exports from climate exposed countries and this, this will link into some of the policy implications that I will discuss at the end of the presentation. So empirical evidence, um, what is the impact of climate change on sovereign borrowing costs? And this is based on recent work along with uh, Ulrich Volz and Nuba Renzi. There's a ADBI working paper on this as referred to in the note at the bottom of the slide. Um, what we can see here is the basic relationship between the cost of sovereign borrowing or sovereign bond yield relative to climate risk vulnerability on the left-hand panel. On the right-hand panel, we have the basic relationship between the sovereign bond yield and climate risk resilience. And what we can see here clearly is that we have a positive relationship apparent between the yield and vulnerability. So increasing vulnerability to uh, climate change is associated with a rising sovereign bond yield or rising cost of sovereign borrowing, whereas the opposite effect is apparent for resilience. So the right-hand panel. In other words, improving resilience to the negative effects of climate change can have a dampening effect on sovereign bond yields. So this is what the basic relationship looking at the data tells us across a wide variety of, of different economies. Um, and that, that underpins the analysis that's carried out in that paper. And what do we find? Um, so on the left-hand panel, without going into too much technical detail, essentially what we find is that countries that are more highly exposed to the effects of climate change incur higher risks, so, sorry, incur higher uh, premia on their sovereign bond yields. So that's what we see in the left-hand panel. So um, countries that are deemed highly exposed to climate risks will face sovereign bond yield premia in the region of around 270, 280 basis points. Um, and th this compares to the ASEAN group as a whole of, of around 150 basis points, EMEs, overall just over 100 basis points um, and the sample of all 40 economies is, is somewhat lower. So what we can tell from this is that um, the countries who are most vulnerable to climate risk face the highest premia on their sovereign bond deals and this is an important point to consider because of course the countries that are most highly exposed to climate risk are the ones that are most in need of adaptation and mitigation and resilience investment and so on. And it's a problem for those economies because they face the highest cost of sovereign borrowing and um, the highest hindrance um, to, to carry out that investment. And this, of course, will spill over to one of the important policy implications that fall out of this study. On the right-hand panel, without going into too much detail, we, we go a little bit deeper with the analysis and indeed we find that um, the response of sovereign bond yields to shocks imposed on climate risk vulnerability are permanent over time and they're statistically significant um, at a, a horizon of um, up to 30 quarters. And what we see for the sovereign bond yield response to Resilience is a negative response, which is in line with what we would expect. Um, so improving resilience reduces bond yields. And again, the, we find that the effect is permanent. It does not uh, disappear over time um, and it's statistically significant. So countries should be encouraged by this and, and seek to ramp up their efforts towards adaptation and resilience to um, achieve these uh, lower effects or dampening effects on their sovereign bond yields. So the, the results from the analysis are striking in two main ways. The first way um, is that it's clear that vulnerability to climate risk matters substantially more for the cost of sovereign borrowing than resilience. So we can see here that for resilience, which is yeah, I didn't mention the resilience because it's very low in magnitude, although it is statistically significant. Um, the magnitude of this 
the magnitude of the climate risk resilience effects on sovereign bond yields is less than 10 basis points across the board, across the global sample. Whereas what we see from the coefficients on climate risk vulnerability are very large magnitudes, so very high um, impacts on sovereign bond yields. So vulnerability appears to matter more, although it's important to remember um, that we find statistical significance across the board. So economies should be encouraged to, um, to uh, invest in adaptation and mitigation going forward. Secondly, we find that, um, as I mentioned, the effect is much higher for those more exposed to climate risks um, by a factor of around two for the high risk group compared to EMEs overall. And as I said, this creates a problem for these economies because they are most in need of um, investment and adaptation, yet they face the highest premium on their sovereign bond yields in order to um, address the problems that they face. So, yeah, let me turn to the, to the next point, the next part of the presentation, which is on the policy implications. So what fell out of the empirical work and the analysis of um, conceptual transmission channels, more of the theoretical side, were a number of policy implications, actionable policy areas, which um, governments and national authorities are encouraged to um, implement um, in order to mitigate and manage climate-related sovereign risks. Um, and we basically came up with five main areas, which I will go through one by one. Uh, so the first one is about understanding the extent of, of the exposure. The second one is about mainstreaming climate risk analysis. The third one is about um, integrating um, into the monetary and prudential framework climate risk analysis. So central banks have a key role to play there. The, set, the fourth one is about um, the implementation of financial sector policies to scale up investment um, and to find solutions, not only on, on insurance, but also on um, ways to assist these economies which are highly exposed to climate change and face the highest premium on their sovereign bond deals. And this links also to the fifth point, which is about the provision of international support. That's um, an overview of what the five areas are. So, yeah, so the first point, of course, it's important for, at the outset to understand what the exposure is. So we have recommended the implementation of a comprehensive vulnerability assessment and national adaptation, of, ad, sorry, national adaptation plan. So governments need to conduct comprehensive sectoral and national vulnerability assessments over multiple time spans and to identify climate related sovereign risk and develop national adaptation plans. So a key component of this will be to undertake um, stress tests and different scenarios. So different tail risks associated with uh, climate um, related events in order to understand the, the, the exposure that they face and the link between um, their exposure to climate change and the cost of sovereign borrowing, both for, on transition risks and physical risks. Um, we've also recommended that this should be, or could at least could be conducted by a national climate risk board, which should include the central bank and financial supervisor as well as the, the government, because um, we, th we feel that this is important from a macro prudential and macroeconomic perspective to, to uh, involve the, the central bank closely in this vulnerability assessment. Um, second point is on mainstreaming climate risk analysis, sorry, into public financial management. So a full integration of the assessment of climate risk analysis needs to be made into uh, public financial management, including appropriate disclosure analysis, um, management of climate risk to public finances, budgetary process need to account for climate risk and mainstream relevant policies and laws. Um, so I think that this is an important area which needs urgent action. Um, 
I think over the last few years, um, it's become apparent that this is a priority policy area which needs to be addressed um, given the implications for the sovereign risk profile. Um, one of the areas that I will touch upon in a couple of slides is on the risk sharing element and the need for governments to um, issue securities that have risk sharing characteristics um, such as um, bonds that have uh, natural disaster clauses included, um, as well as a diversification of government revenue streams away from high risk sectors. And this can be done in a gradual, um, on a gradual basis. As I mentioned, the, the third factor relates to the adjustment of monetary and prudential frameworks to account for climate risks. So as well as mainstreaming um, into public financial management, it's important to also integrate climate risks into the monetary and prudential frameworks of central banks. Um, so this relates to the disclosure of climate and other sustainability risks um, and climate stress tests of financial institutions to be conducted uh, on a regular basis. Um, full disclosure is, uh, is key in order to appropriately um, assess the, the, the risks that climate change would have for financial stability. Um, and these goals and uh, um, macro, sorry, monetary and prudential measures should be aligned with uh, these, these climate goals. So the, the, the climate risk analysis should be fully integrated into the, the operational framework. Okay. Fourth point is on the implementation um, of policies to scale up investment in climate adaptation and resilience and develop insurance solutions. So one of the ways I, I talked before about the implications of climate change for financial sector stability and the spillover of this to, to sovereign risk. I also talked about the fact that countries that are highly exposed to uh, climate change are the ones most in need of uh, investment in climate adaptation, yet face the highest premium on their sovereign bonds due to uh, climate change. So there's a there's a, a need to somehow address this issue um, from a policy perspective. And one of the ways that governments can play a role is through further enhancement to um, local currency bond markets aimed at uh, sustainable investment, um, sustainable climate resilient investment and uh, infrastructure, um, as well as fintech solutions for mobilizing domestic savings for this purpose as well. Um, and this, this can reduce the strain on the public finances and enable um, sustainable investment, which is climate resilient. Um, the insurance um, issue is a also an important policy issue because of course this can help poorer more vulnerable groups um, to protect themselves from um, these impacts and this can in turn reduce the strain on the public finances and improve or at least um, have a less negative impact on the sovereign risk profile the final point is on international support to mitigate and manage climate-related sovereign risk. Um, I think that the international, international financial institutions have a special role to play um, to help countries to address climate-related sovereign risk and, and strengthen adaptive capacity, as well as macro financial resilience. So there's a lot of issues. Um, there are a lot of issues that um, can be supported by international financial institutions and in terms of the specific areas, there are five um, provided on the slide. So across technical assistance and training, surveillance and risk monitoring. Um, so at the start of the policy implications discussion, I talked about the need for vulnerability uh, assessment and development of a na national adaptation plan. International financial institutions can provide assistance on how to do that as well as on 
ongoing surveillance, not only um, short term, but importantly, at the, at the long term. And that's why um, it's important that there's some knowledge uh, sharing from the international financial institutions to economies who may be lacking that expertise. Um, as well as that, actual finance for adaptation and resilience investment should be considered not only loans, but also in, in the form of grants. Of course, loans may actually um, increase burdens depending on, on the situation of a particular country's public finances. So there may be a need for consideration of alternative financing arrangements, developing insurance solutions, including through the use of fintech, as I developed, as I mentioned, is uh, an important consideration, um, as well as finally, uh, emergency lending and crisis support. So, I mean, with that brief presentation, I say thank you. Um, I've covered in the reasonably rapid time, um, the conceptual transmission channels are some empirical evidence and the policy implications that fall out of that analysis. And yes, once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Byrne, for a comprehensive presentation, as well as the uh, interesting finding and the use useful set of policy recommendations. The next session is the panel discussion, which uh, is focused on the mitigating and managing climate-related sovereign risk in Asia and the Pacific. I'd like to invite my colleague, Dr. Peter Morgan, the Vice Chair of the Research and the Senior Consulting Economist, uh, to be the moderator for this one. Joining him, we also have an honor to welcome Dr. Simon Bacto, the head of the Climate Biodiversity and Water Division of Environment uh, Directorate from OECD. Dr. Aladin Lilo, the Senior Econom Economic Advisor from Economic Research Institute from, uh, for ASEAN and East Asia. Dr. Wenchai Cheng, the Vice President of the Agricultural Development Bank of China. Ms. Aigun Kusali, Kusali Yeva, the Director of the Green Finance Intelligence uh, uh, of the Astana International Finance Center, Center Green, fin Green Finance Center, Kazakhstan, and Dr. Nurun Naha, the Joint Chief of Gr uh, Programming Division, Bangladesh Planning Commission, the Ministry of Planning, Bangladesh. So with uh, no further ado, I give the floor to Dr. Morgan. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Pichaya. I'm delighted to host this very distinguished panel. Uh, given the shortness of time, uh, let's go right to the uh, uh, panelists' interventions. Uh, I would like to ask each, each panel to, to limit their intervention to eight minutes. I'll give a warning about uh, one minute before the end, but uh, let's start with uh, 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 Mr. Simon Buckle. Simon, the floor is yours. You have eight minutes. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. I, I sent some PowerPoints. I'm not sure if they'll be loaded for me or I should load them. I'm happy to load them if I think. Do we have the PowerPoints? If not, I can I can share them perhaps. Yep. Yes, yes, please go ahead then. Yeah, that might be quicker. Um, okay. So you should be able to, to see that, I hope. Um, yes, we so can see it fine. Thank you. First, th thank you very much for um, inviting me here, and um, it's a great pleasure to to be part of this. And, and thanks very much to John for really, really interesting, fascinating paper and presentation, and to Ingrid for a really stimulating um, plenary introduction. So, what I would um, say, and I, I'm just trying to make sure my screen moves on. I does that move to the next slide? Can you put the uh, the file on the on slideshow? It's uh, still just okay. The, it's it's, yeah, it's it's not on slideshow okay. yet. Right. I'm sorry about that. Slight technical problem there. Hopefully yeah. That's okay. That's fine. Yeah. So um, yes, we've we've got these three risks that that um, Bank of England and then, um, the FSB task force uh, financial. Uh, related disclosures as well promoted, which is the the, the transition risks, um, 
you know, how are we going to get to these very, very stringent, ambitious goals of, of, of net zero by around the middle of the century. And, and the risks here, you know, are, are, are very much of, of um, orderly, disorderly transitions which is within the financial system because they've got holdings in, in fossil, fossil intensive sectors and, and so on. So, so very clear risks here. And uh, it's not just around energy industry and transport, but obviously, as, as John mentioned, around agriculture, but also land use where we're seeing, you know, um, big impacts on climate change from um, land use change from deforestation, forest degradation, and, and the consequent uh, impacts of that, like forest fires, wildfires. So then we, we have the physical, the physical risks that, that, you know, is driving the vulnerability that, that, that John focused on a lot. And this is just a, a, a little chart of the projected precipitation from an old IPCC report, actually. And you can see very different patterns of, of change in rainfall and intensity and frequency across the globe. Um, this is this is quite uncertain, actually, and um, you know, apart from the broad patterns of, of of you know more intense around the tropics and higher latitudes and drying in the subtropics, the actual patterns of rainfall affecting any particular region are highly uncertain, and that's because modelling the dynamics of of weather, you know, on fifty year timescales is is hugely difficult, and so I think this is implications as well for public policy in terms of thinking through macroeconomic resilience and, and, and uh, also the investments in infrastructure and, and, and adaptation preparations needed. And that's something that's not always adequately understood because people just sort of think, oh, we've got climate projections, let's just build to that. But the models differ. Sometimes they even differ in the sign of some of the critical changes that will happen in a given location. And they're not talking about marginal changes either. And as well as the extremes, we've got these slow onset events, the sea level rise, and far worse than that, potentially um, these potential tipping points in the climate system that might drive more far reaching changes, whether it's the slowdown of the Antarctic, the returning circulation, the collapse of the West Antarctic, or West Antarctic ice sheet, or um, forest dieback and turning to savannah, say in, in the Amazon. And we've also got a new risk, I think, that, that might be worth highlighting in addition to the, to the very good analysis of the physical and transition risks in John's paper, which is the climate justice or the, the liability risks, if you like. And we've seen that manifest in a sense um, already in Germany, just in this last few days, with the decision by the Constitutional Court that their 2013 climate strategy violates the rights and freedoms of, of citizens, you know, particularly the young people who are going to face the biggest burden of reducing emissions in the future because not enough action is taken in the present. And so the German government is going to have to revise its climate strategy and act. And that's going to have implications for fiscal issues and for revenue issues. So, so I, I think we have to also bear in mind this, this additional dimension going forward. Now, I just want to focus in on the, uh, sorry, the physical risks a little bit. It's worth teasing this out a bit more. And we see um, the physical risk composed of, of the hazard, or you can think of the hazard as a maybe a cyclone of a certain intensity um, or the exposure, the assets and people at risk and the vulnerability, how, how, how sensitive are you to those hazards and that exposure. And um, as Ingrid said, I think very clearly at the start, the best thing we can do to reduce the hazard is to act quickly and decisively to reduce greenhouse gas emissions so that we can achieve the, these net zero targets. Um, the scale of that challenge is huge. Uh, we've, we've had some better news following the announcements at the Leaders Summit in 22nd of April, but much more remains to be done to turn these, these great long-term goals into effective short-term actions, and we have to get um, moving on that. It's, uh, it's clear that some countries can make progress more rapidly than others. The, the structural characteristics, the level of development, all these um, issues, natural resource endowments are all critical, and some sectors will be harder to address than others. So it means that every sector has to get to net zero if it can, because we're going to have to offset and have negative emissions to deal with some of the really hard to address sectors and activities that we'll still need to carry out. Agriculture being one, maybe um, maybe some of the uh, heavy goods and, and, and uh, transport for trade, maybe, maybe other aspects that, that are very difficult to decarbonize. And on this diagram from the IPCC, you can see that to the actions to reduce hazards include nature-based solutions, I'll call them. 
you know, but using nature and ecosystems to, to reduce the intensity of the challenges, whether it's a storm surge or, or um, floods or, or drought scarcity. But again, there's big challenges to scale these up. And vulnerability will be reduced by uh, investments in resilient infrastructure, as we've heard already, and that's that's clearly challenging. Um, absolutely agree with Ingrid's emphasis on, on social protection, livelihood, diversification, etc., to reduce vulnerability. The low penetration of private insurance is often an issue here as well. And uh, that's that's something that um, you know, maybe even more difficult to address in future as private insurance is unwilling to take on some of these risks and the public authorities in a sense take on the highest tranche of, 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 of these. One minute classes. left, Simon. Is that all? Okay, fine, I'll move on quickly. So um, let's, let's move through the slide. I'm trying to click on it, but it's having problems and moving on. Um, we've got these diverse um, risks, we've got different approaches to decision making that are therefore needed to make us really resilient and these are robust decision making methods I don't dwell on them um, we've got ex ante and ex post measures that can can really help us to manage the sovereign risks we've got to understand the risks reduce exposures invest in resilience and, and sharing risk transfer and again I would echo John's point um, that that you know overseas development assistance or the actions of the MDBs you know is critical here both ex ante and ex post humanitarian assistance, obviously, in the wake of disasters, meeting the 100 billion commitment by the developed countries, um, also a, a critical issue here. Um, and you can see that the investment in adaptation is, is very small, really. It's around 20% 20, 20 of total flows measured in 2018 uh, from that bit of research. Uh, time's up. So that's great. And I would like to thank you very much. Um, I just would say that um we we applaud the emphasis on this the risks are going to get greater the frequency may get greater too so it's very timely to focus on this thank you very much okay thanks very much so our second panelist is dr aladdin rillo uh, aladdin the floor is yours you have eight minutes thank you peter sorry i hope you can hear me thank yes, you so fine. much peter, and it's indeed very nice to see you again uh, let me begin by thanking ADBI for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, webinar, an important topic of uh, climate change and sovereign risk. For my interventions, I would like to frame my comments by providing some regional perspectives on the issue of risk financing, particularly in the context of ASEAN. As you know, ASEAN is one of the most dynamic regions in the world today. Yet, I think it is also one of the most vulnerable when it comes to natural disasters. More and more disasters are actually occurring in this region and in greater intensities. And in my view, I, I think uh, climate change is one of the factors that is also adding to this uncertainty. Of course, there are other factors that account for that, including, for example, rampant uh, urbanization and uh, overpopulation in the region. For example, within the region, we've seen rapidly expanding mega cities like Bangkok, Jakarta, and Manila, as well as many secondary cities that are located in low-lying coastal areas. In my view, these conditions have actually uh, exposed these cities and their assets to adverse nat na natural disasters. And coupled with uh, adverse uh, weather conditions in the region as well, they have actually amplified the losses from these disasters over time. One estimate from the World Bank, I think this was a few years ago, uh, suggests that the, on the average, the total losses from disasters in ASEAN amount to around 4.4 billion US dollars per year, or equivalent to 0.2% of the region's GDP. I'm sure the numbers today will be much higher than that. So given the rapidly expanding disaster economic losses in ASEAN, the region has actually recognized early on that uh, disaster risk cannot be treated anymore as an exogenous factor okay, in the region's pursuit of uh, sustainable economic growth and development. In fact, the way I see it, uh, disaster management and uh, 
uh, sustainable economic development are highly intertwined in a sense that for the region to advance to a more sustainable and inclusive and greener growth path, it is, I think, imperative for ASEAN to be able to also mitigate uh, the, the climate change and also to build uh, the, or invest in uh, disaster management measures in the region. An integral part of the strategy in the region right now is how to develop a more holistic approach on uh, disaster uh, financing, risk financing, uh, particularly by uh, advancing uh, risk, uh, risk financing as well as risk transfer that would enable the region not only to enhance the financial and fiscal resilience in, in among countries in ASEAN, but also to be able to protect the lives of many peoples in the region. And these objectives, in my view, uh, uh, have been uh, uh, achieved over time through the various uh, regional initiatives that ASEAN has implemented over the years. And two important initiatives, if I may, I uh, want to mention, uh, one is the ASEAN Disaster Risk Financing and Insurance Program. This was actually implemented in 2016. And the other one is the Southeast Asia Disaster Risk Financing and Insurance Facility established in 2018. These two initiatives are intended or designed to elevate the risk financing and risk uh, transfer strategies and policies within the region. So let me further elaborate. I think the way disaster risk financing is addressed in ASEAN has been actually uh, uh, defined in, or, or, or contained in, uh, by looking at two important considerations. The first consideration is the need to build capacity as, as well as to develop knowledge on risk financing. Uh, I think ASEAN has recognized uh, over time that to be able to uh, address adequately risk financing needs in ASEAN, there is a need to be able to assess uh, the, the future risks as well as to understand the, the previous disasters through capacity building and information sharing, particularly in a number of areas. And I think this includes, for example, risk uh, financing policies, disaster uh, assessment or uh, disaster management assess, uh, and assessment and so forth. And the, mo the main objective of which is to be able to allow or enable countries in the, in the region to develop cost-effective and sustainable uh, uh, trans risk financing solutions at the national, sub-regional, and uh, at the regional levels. So if you look at what's happening in ASEAN, I think over the years, ASEAN has intensified the ability to assess uh, disaster risk exposure and uh, risk financing solutions through the development of uh, uh, databases as well as analytical tools. Uh, for example, uh, within the region, we have developed a template for economic uh, exposure database as well as economic uh, losses database for uh, Laos, uh, I think Thailand and Vietnam. And I think work is underway uh, for other countries as well. In addition to that, there are also what we call as risk advisory services being provided to enable countries to develop uh, sovereign risk financing mechanism as well as risk, uh, risk transfer solutions uh, and policies and strategies over time. Uh, I think the more or the most important uh, activities or initiatives related to these are the conduct of uh, risk country assessment in the region, the development of report on uh, catastrophe pooling in, in ASEAN, as well as the, the development of uh, what we call as in-country uh, or the conduct of in-country uh, uh, consultations. There are in fact already six uh, 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 risk country assessments being developed for six countries in the region and I think work is underway to develop more. And finally, I think there's also uh, this uh, capacity building and knowledge sharing that has been an important part of this uh, uh, ob objective to promote greater understanding of disaster risk financing in ASEAN. And I think ADBI has been also supporting ASEAN in this uh, regard, particularly in understanding not only the general issues on disaster risk financing, but as well as on sector specific uh, issues on, on disaster risk financing, such as, for example, agricultural insurance or even the public asset uh, financial protection program. 
Second consideration, and I think the more important one, is the ability for the region to be able to develop uh, financial products or insurance products in the region. And I think that is something that has been uh, uh, achieved over time through the different initiatives in ASEAN. And one important initiative here is the Southeast Asia Disaster Risk Financing and Insurance Facility. This actually is a multi-service uh, uh, regional platform. The objective of CDRIP is to be able to uh, enhance uh, financial and fiscal resilience among countries in ASEAN plus three region. And to date, uh, one Probably of- a, a, a time is about up. Oh, okay, uh, uh, one important objective here is to be able to enhance financial resilience. So I think in closing, I just want to highlight here the importance of uh, regional cooperation in, in uh, addressing uh, disaster risk financing in ASEAN. I fully agree with the recommendations by John, but in my view, there is a need for regional cooperation to be able to develop a more a regional agenda on disaster risk financing. Thank you, Peter. Thanks very much. Our next panelist is Dr. Zhang Wansai. Uh, Dr. Zhang, you have the floor. You, you have eight minutes, please. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, colleagues. I'm very happy to join this uh, side event. I, I think the topic is, uh, is uh, really relevant and uh, very important. Uh, global climate change and, and uh, ensuring uh, frequent extreme events in particular has brought uh, uh, severe consequences to people's uh, security, livelihood, and well-being, as well as to sustainable social economic development. Climate change sovereign risk published by the ADBI systematically analyzes uh, uh, the trans transmission channel through which uh, climate change affects uh, sovereign uh, risk. Climate change is a challenge to all mankind and impose what comes to be known as a green uh, swan risk to the financial system. Ramification from climate change create negative feedback loops between the inside financial system, financial sector, and the real economy, ultimately magnifying financial risks. The adequate response to climate change could mean a severe consequences for a country. China has always had great importance dealing with the climate change. We have uh, announced that the strategic aim of having CO2 emission peak before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060 actively implement a national strategy action plan to tackle climate change and taken adaptive measures we are working to curb financial risk. Uh, uh, as a, uh, a representative of the financial sector, I think I, I, uh, the financial sector uh, can and should uh, play an uh, important role in the combating climate change and help uh, helping lower sovereign risk, uh, credit risk. First of all, we should uh, pay more attention to the climate risk in our risk management. Uh, the, the climate risk could have a severe and material impact on the project and on the on, and we finance and the quality of the assets. We need to adopt a high standard of the ESGs and green credit policy. We need to support more climbing, climate resilient and environmentally sustainable project, not financing those projects or industries with higher consumption of energy and higher uh, pollution. For those projects with a government borrowing or government borrowing, a guarantee to manage the climate risk will directly help lower sovereign risk. Second, we should mobilize more financial resources to support green credit and green projects. More climate financing for climate adaptation and mitigation is essential. This includes more co-financing among MDBs, government, national financial institutions, private sector, and more use of innovative financial instruments such as issuing a green bond uh, or climate bonds, use of a guarantee or, or, and risk transfer among, and so on and so forth. Thirdly, we should work together to support global, regional and national efforts of mobilizing resources, transferring technology and building capacity as needed to deal with, with the climate change. Both develop, developing countries are facing challenges of climate change, but developing countries uh, particularly uh, having difficulties in coping with the challenge and implementing Paris Agreement. And they need more support for the transition to green and low carbon development. The transition is costly and could also be very risky if not managed in a well. Let me have a few more words about uh, the, the bank I'm working for, the Agricultural Development Bank of China or ADBC. Uh, ADBC is the only national policy bank 
in China for developing agriculture, uh, rural areas and the farmers. Uh, as you all know, agricultural sector has been very vulnerable to the climate change and the sector itself is also one of the main contributors to GHG emissions. Over the years, ADBC has been focusing on the supporting food security, poverty alleviation, rural revitalization, agriculture, modernization, agriculture, rural develop uh, constructions, including the rural infrastructure develop construction, regional coordinated development and uh, ecological civilization. In recent years, ADBC has stepped up efforts to support green development, including support for the conservation of Yangtze River and the Yellow River, green development agriculture and rural areas and national land greening action. We have uh, introduced new and better green credit products, issue green bonds, both at home and abroad, and the uh, scale up our green credit and lending. As of end of uh, last year, uh, we have uh, provided a total of over uh, 800, the 800 billion RMB of loan to eco industry, green upgrading of the infrastructure, energy conservation, and uh, environmental protection. Uh, as of the uh, uh, end of uh, first quarter this year, uh, the balance of green credit exceeded 960 billion Chinese yuan, about, uh, uh, which is about 15% of a total uh, credit. Where we deliver uh, our operations, we have also attached green importance to risk management, taking measures to prevent and resolve the credit risk. We fully realize that as a policy bank, uh, we have the responsibility to manage it you know, our own risk and also to maintain the financial stability and security of the country as a whole. These efforts have contributed to steady growth in agriculture and the rural economy, agriculture modernization, as well as the government, uh, a green development of China, where helping reducing, reduce climate related risk and the financial risks. So dear colleagues, I think uh, it's become a global uh, consensus that we, we, we all need to, we need to combat climate change and uh, uh, promote green development. The green trans transformation of the world, however, is a, a arduous task that requires unprecedented resolve and action from all of us. Let's work together to achieve our common goals. ADBC is looking forward to working with all of you for this important endeavor. With this, I will stop here. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, our next panelist is Ms. Aigul Kusalieva. Ms. Kusalieva, the floor is yours. You have eight minutes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for having me here today. Uh, I represent EAC Green Finance Center, and let me briefly stop on the background of Financial Center, and then tell you more about Kazakhstan and those things uh, we are doing on the ground to address the climate issues. So basically, Financial Center was established uh, in 2018 to as a separate jurisdiction within uh, former Astana city, which is in Ur Sultan now. And basically, the main objectives of the Financial Center is assisting the uh, non in development, assisting the development of non-banking uh, sector of Kazakhstan uh, by providing certain, um, uh, you know, like favorable environment for investment and in becoming the financial hub for the region, including Central Asia, Eastern Europe, and the Caucasus. And uh, for that reason, the financial center is uh, enhancing the growth uh, by, you know, like indicating the main pillars uh, to work on which include capital markets, asset management, uh, Islamic finance, fintech, and also pays attention to green finance. And therefore, I think uh, it, would, it would be important to say that actually green finance is becoming even more essential in the light of our commitments within Paris Agreement and uh, our recent, um, let's say, commitment of the country to become carbon neutral by 2060. So um, developing countries actually particularly affected by the impact of climate change because they are more vulnerable and uh, they have lower capacity to cope with that. And in fact, Kazakhstan is also facing certain environmental um, challenges, including the uh, desertification of the area in the land or in the area of ROC and uh, let's say form of nuclear policy, nuclear sites, form of nuclear sites and uh, there is also a problem there are problems with the air pollution and government is taking steps to address those issues uh, by introducing the 
documents at the level of, uh, let's say, government bodies as the strategies and the concepts. And I just want to mention uh, briefly two of them, I think, which are more relevant here today. It's a concept of a transition to a green economy, which was uh, adopted like nearly seven years ago. And this year, we're uh, updating this document by uh, adopting a new strategy uh, for low carbon development of the country until 2060. And we expect that this strategy will be uh, sort of uh, addressing our commitment to become carbon neutral by 2060. And uh, going back to the uh, to our commitments, we do understand that uh, those initiatives will need investment and uh, become green uh, will, will take like most of the funds. And according to the uh, experts who are working on this strategy, actually, uh, we'll need around 350 billion USD dollars in 2050 um, as a significant investment for the decarbonization of the economy. But it also there is also projection that our GDP will be growing uh, of 223%. So uh, when we talk about those investment needed for the deep decarbonization of the economy, we understand that this is the green finance we need, you know. And our center is working on a certain initiatives to support the government and also to support, support the uh, local regu regulator in the introducing the financial center uh, policies. So I'm really happy that uh, ADB Institute is bringing up this topic and uh, this research is uh, really brilliant. Uh, in showing those uh, sort of toolkit for the policymakers uh, where to pay attention. And now I just want to stop at the part for the financial sector policies. So uh, basically we support the green bond issuers at AFC and uh, we do provide uh, support to our local regulator, I already mentioned. And last year we had the first green bond issuance uh, in Kazakhstan. Uh, it was also followed by the issuance of ATB, uh, ATP Green Bond, which was a uh, 32 million USD uh, dollar amount, uh, but in local currency. And it's quite good measure to support the local currency bond market. And if we talk about the local financial regulator, I just want to briefly mention here that we are working on the development of sustainable finance roadmap for the country. And we also understand the importance of the disclosure. And uh, there is a plan to develop the environment and social risk assessment guidelines for the second tier banks in Kazakhstan. And another important uh, initiative I want to mention here is introduction of the uh, special measures to support the green projects in Kazakhstan. So starting July this year, uh, almost like in two months, we'll be having the subsidies for green projects, which will be financed through the green credits and green bonds. And uh, there will be up to 50% subsidies of uh, coupon uh, payments of the bond and uh, in the interest rates of green credits. Uh, for that, uh, like for that uh, main goal, we're also introducing the green taxonomy of the country. So the taxonomy is being uh, still, uh, let's say, like it's being uh, approved by the government bodies, and we expect that it will be operational starting July, along with these uh, measures. Uh, for the subsidies. So basically, I think um, that's all maybe from my side, uh, just like in the interest of the time, I'll stop here maybe. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to address them. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. And our final panelist is Dr. Narun uh, uh, Nahar. Uh, uh, Dr. Nahar, the floor is yours. You have eight minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Narun Nahar uh, from Bangladesh Planning Commission. It is a great pleasure to be here. And I would like to congratulate uh, the, uh, the, uh, the authors of the report and um, ADP for hosting such an uh, excellent webinar. Um, having her, her, uh, read the uh, uh, report and, got, uh, and listening to the um, um, summary of the report and other panelists, um, I would just like to highlight um, uh, what some uh, best practices from Bangladesh, uh, because time is uh, short. Um, um, the report has rightly pointed out about the, you know, the uh, sovereign risk, the climate change, how it can affect the sovereign risk, how the uh, cost of borrowing may increase, and it has rightly pointed out the channels of uh, the risk drivers uh, and what kind of risk we need to um, um, identify and, and given some policy recommendations for all the countries to follow. Uh, having, um, uh, un, uh, following this um, um, uh, recommendations, uh, I just like to point out. So, where is Bangladesh? Um, you know, it's just um, 
um, uh, the developing country and it is graduating, graduating uh, into a developing country from the least developing country. And uh, according to German Watch, it is one of the seventh uh, ranked out of the uh, tenth most um, uh, vulnerable countries. It is uh, ranked seventh, and also from the ND Gain uh, report, it is also a very highly vulnerable country because due to its um, um, uh, uh, location and uh, location and the topographical nature, uh, and it is all. all, all around the year um, affected by different hazards such as um, cyclones, um, uh, rains, heavy rains, flash flood, so storm surge, drought, etc. And so next, next slide. Please. So, um, so we understand, um, um, we all know, so what are the climate impacts on, uh, you know, um, a small country of Bangladesh, which is very, um, has a high density of population and is aspiring to be a developing country and, and a developed country by 2041. And Bangladesh has been you know, working on a disaster, a risk mitigate, disaster risk mitigation since the independence. And here in the slide, I would just like to show like, uh, so where, where, are, where are we putting the investments? Because it's, um, uh, yes, we, we, we need to understand uh, the cost of our um, activities, but we need to break down into where the impacts are. So here in this slide, um, it shows that six key ministries of Bangladesh government um, has in the last five years, um, in the, during the six five year plan, um, did uh, took uh, at least six six and ninety nine project just directly related to disaster risk reduction, and it is uh, almost spread uh, all over the country, with mostly in the coastal areas of Bangladesh. So that is the most vulnerable area of Bangladesh. Even being a small country, uh, from the north to south, from east to west, the vulnerability landscape, hazard landscape varies. So we need to keep in mind uh, but, uh, uh, of that um, uh, nature of the hazard, hazard escape. And um, so having said this, and I would just like to point out what we are doing right now, um, we have been doing during the last um, um, uh, decade or so, but right now just like to point out some key um, um, uh, activities done by planning commission especially. So next slide, please. Um, so yes, um, um, we, we understand um, about the so what's the sovereign risk, uh, how climate change can impact the sovereign risk, and that is also true for Bangladesh. And it is also a, a worrying situation, uh, um, if not a scarier situation. So we need to Bangladesh also needs to understand uh, the future future impacts on its sovereign uh, borrowing. Yes, but having said that, um, I would like to just concentrate on. Um, our development um, initiatives to give the participants some um, um, view of what we are doing. So we, Bangladesh follows a top-down approach of uh, development planning, the national planning, and where it's 30% uh, of its investments come from the government and the rest from the pri private sector. And the government is approaching a planned way of development, both for the government sector and the uh, private sector. So what can we do to um, you know, make these development risk informed? So it has adopted the, the risk informed development approach of development, not just a regular way of development of you know, GDP growth and poverty elevation. That was um, the target um, of all the governments uh, in Bangladesh. <clears throat> so so we, will we will try to have the risk informations integrated into development mostly, and uh, these are similar to the, all the risk issues uh, mentioned in these reports, um, fiscal tr transition and financial risk as well. But here I would like to say that, um, so what will, will happen in the um, pub public sector investment? So what we're doing, um, we want to, change the way we are doing the uh, regular investment planning through some systemic change. So here, for example, I just put, put some keywords such as climate disaster risk information platform. We, we, uh, we are trying to build a database, a platform where all the climate disaster risks are there. So where the different ministries and departments who does the uh, proposes a project, big projects that our country needs, 
can um, access this data and um, analyze and incorporate in their development project uh, performa so that it, it, it is um, um, it gives us the idea so how much we need how much cost we need for the data service reduction or the climate change adaptation and so that is the information system but we also need the tools so we are working on the tools such as the disaster impact assessment so before starting a project we would like to ensure that the project does not create more risk to the surrounding risks and and also uh, understand what could be the um, impact of the you know the climate and uh, risk a uh, disaster risk on the uh, outputs of the projects um, the outputs of a project will last 10 or to 20 years uh, and so we, we need to understand that so this tool uh, will, will help uh, in giving the um, um, the minister of planning and understanding of so how much additional um, um, cost we need to ensure for the, our DIA uh, to make it, you know, uh, risk sensitive. And also we have the climate risk screening, uh, basically as of the projects. If a project is um, screened for any, all the climate hazards, we have at least, um, um, uh, you know, identified our, by our um, Institute of Disaster Management um, that we um, there are 10 natural hazards we should consider in any any of the you know hazard an analysis whether it's at risk by risk meaning a calculation calculating in, in an index base and if it's a higher level risk then we go for a climate risk vulnerable assessment so how can we do that we also take help of risk atlas so risk atlas uh, we have done it through the support from adb uh, technical Sorry. assistance one minute left yes Dr. Nahar. and yeah and um, this is um, uh, my last, I just took two slides, picture slides, and, and do, doing the cost benefit analysis with, uh, to, to identify the right disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation options. And not only for the, um, and also we have uh, climate finance tracking of national budget, and the Minister of Finance and adopted a climate fiscal framework where most of the issues that have been raised at least has been adopted, but we need to practice it more and implement it more. And last is the point of the resilience of um, risk in from private sector investment. Uh, we are working on resilience supply chain where also it has come out in this report, uh, doing an, a risk profile of the um, uh, particular business sector, and also whether we can help the private sector with a business continuity plan when, so that in, when a disaster strikes, the business can come into operation from, um, become resilient and you know the uh, production can continue um, uh, as quick as possible because that is very important for you know, a country like Bangladesh. Next, just I will end with just my last slide. So these are the risks I just mentioned. Um, uh, it will help the planners to identify, uh, locate the risk of, uh, understand about the risk of the location of the their project. It could be in one area or multiple areas, and it, it goes for all the hazards, um, 10 hazards. Just here, I have three hazards mentioned. Next slide. Next slide. This is my last slide. So uh, we were working on the supply chain resilience it is very important bangladesh uh, the ready made garment sector uh, is a very important sector uh, for, for the economic bangladesh so even that is also vulnerable so we, we need to make sure that you know when a big disaster strikes you know the flooding or, or a storm surge whether it can how quickly it can get back to business so uh, we need to know what solutions are needed to make the supply chain resilient and so these are the things when we've been working on to make the private sector also uh, uh, more resilient. So all this together, I think will help us to get a better picture, you know, uh, understanding of our, I think, so sovereign risks uh, in the coming years. But of course, uh, the linkages are a weak from the fiscal risk to the financial sector risk. I think it will be helpful if um, you know more studies are done uh, country-wise and you know more regional cooperation are there um, to share the best practices. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I think we've had some uh, excellent and quite diverse explanations of uh, responses to climate change. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time now. So let me turn the floor back to Pichaya. Thank you very much, Dr. Morgan. And thank you all the excellent uh, insight from the, pa the panelists. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time and we don't we cannot have the Q&A session anymore, but we encourage you just to type your question in Q&A box in case we, uh, um, the panelists can 
help answering is there. So last but not least, I think we can come to the closing section. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sang Jubek, the Deputy Dean of the Asian Development Bank Institute to deliver the closing remarks for us. Uh, Deputy Dean Beck, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vichaya. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Sang Jubek, uh, Deputy Dean of the ADBI. Um, I'm very sorry to say this closing mark. If we could have more time, there would be uh, more discussions. Uh, today, um, Dr. John Benny of the ADBI uh, made a presentation on climate change and the cost of sovereign borrowing. Uh, and um, we had a lot of uh, active discussions on that issue. Um, thank you, Dr. Berin, for your valuable presentation. And also thank you to all the discussants and participants for your meaningful and important discussion and comments. As mentioned today, um, climate change is now uh, considered one of the greatest threats to global social and ec economic stability, as well as its serious impact on the environment uh, and people. Climate change is one of the biggest threats to economic stability and sustainability. Particularly, it is well known that uh, countries and their economies in Asia and the Pacific are the most vulnerable to the risk of climate change. The number of intensity of extreme weather events in this region devastates millions, millions of people, leaving them in abs absolute poverty. Harvests are shrinking, and the disease uh, viruses like COVID-19 are spreading due to higher temperatures. The theme of today's event was based on the notion that climate change is also associated with the sovereign risk of countries. And sovereign credit risk worsen, the higher cost of borrowing has negative ramifications for public investment areas such as health and education, uh, creating additional financial burdens for the government in the long run. And as a result, hurting the long-term sustainability of public debt management as well. However, it is, I think, uh, only recently that we have begun to pay attention to the impact of climate change on sovereign risk. Despite the critical impact that climate change could have on sovereign credit rating, there is still uh, limited research on the transmission channels through which climate change risks affect sovereign risks, in other words, the cost of public funding. Also, limited studies on the possible policy measures to mitigate such risks and the economic losses uh, caused by climate change. In that sense, the publication of the report, Climate Change and the Sovereign Risk in October last year um, could be a big step for better understanding of the ways how to influence the climate change on sovereign risks. As indicated in the report and presented today, Climate change could influence on sovereign risk through uh, seven channels, such as fiscal impact and financial sector stability. Sorry, stability. I would say that uh, to reduce the climate-related risk, the government policies should be more focused on the stable management of the macroeconomy, including fiscal and financial policies. Following the policy recommendations in the presentation of Dr. John, I would like to emphasize again that climate risk analysis and climate risk management uh, needed to be mainstreaming, mainstream in the fiscal and financial management of the government. We needed to consider the risk of climate change as a significant factor in fiscal and financial policy making of the government. Also, I believe global close cooperation and support would be essential to mitigate and manage climate-related sovereign risk, especially in the vulnerable countries in Asia and the Pacific. 
anyway, I believe that um, today's event was a um, good opportunity uh, for the participants, policymakers, and the experts uh, to have gained useful knowledge and policy implications to address the sovereign risks uh, caused by climate change, as well as to mitigate the climate change is risk itself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Dean Beck, for your closing remark. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this webinar. Even though we spent 90 minutes with the, uh, running really quick, we have a lot of fruitful discussion and also comprehensive finding, uh, research finding that share with you. So we hope with all these experiences and the research study will benefit you for your policy uh, design and also the policy framework in the future when it's come to the climate change and sovereign risk. I would like to thank um, uh, Vice President Ingrid Van V of the ADB who participated, as well as all the uh, pan experts and panelists who joined us today on the policy discussion. Last but not least, my ADBI colleagues who has been supporting us through all this, uh, organizing this uh, event, and as well as the ADB colleague too. We would like to encourage you to answer the survey that we will send out so that we can improve our event in the future, as well as visit your feedback back in the topic that we, we, we would like we can organize for you in the in the future so thank you again everyone and we look forward just to welcoming you to the next event of the adbi thank you very much thank you thank you very thank much you. thank you bye-bye thank, thank you thank you thank you bye-bye bye-bye thank you very much